Uh, so we're talking about beef. Me, you both know that you are on the internet, Mr. Kunle. You say we both know the Am what? I lack? You're good at beef. You do beef. What? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what? Me? I'm good at beef. I think so. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I mean, you know, it's just I'm Facebook. Come out with a whole look. Look, you need to do a versus with somebody. I'm waiting for a Kool Aid versus. <laughs> <laughs> Don't nobody want that smoke. Don't oh, that. oh. Anybody ready? To, ain't nobody ready to go twenty <laughs> years. Nah, twenty years with Kool Aid. Niggas ain't ready. Yeah, man. You know, I got, I got some, I got some. Junk. In the tuck, nah, I don't want that. Man. You say you got some jokes stuck away. <laughs> you say you yeah, got... and I know. I say I got some stuff in the tuck, some stuff you know that's that's like yeah. Before people knew about me, I got some I got some heat oh. that you know, oh, that come out. Well, you got to go to the underground because that's when you was hungry. Yeah. That's when yeah. you was, when you was exactly. broke. Exactly. When you wasn't getting them royalties. Exactly. Royalty. <laughs> exactly. I mean, now you exactly. you comfortable exactly. now. <laughs> Yeah, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They, they only know about the last two years and stuff, but it's it's about ten solid years in that in that right, boat. right, right. Now you got them streaming yeah, channels and they looking all right. Exactly. <laughs> Just a little bit, you know. Can pay can pay the bills on time. Cool. You know? Hey, you got to be able to do that. Uh, got to. <laughs> Yo, I'm excited, y'all. So we here, we live, we recording, we live on Facebook. Um, had a, had a couple diff, a uh, couple technical difficulties, as you can tell. Just some changes in the layout, but it's all good. You know what I'm saying? We keep it moving, we keep it rolling. We always surprise y'all doing something different, surprising ourselves sometimes. But it's all good. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and get it going. Welcome back, y'all. Street Academy Podcast, where we keep one foot in the academy and one foot in the streets. This is what we do. We appreciate y'all for joining us, for uh, subscribing, liking, sharing the shows. I've been getting a lot of love. We've been getting a lot of love. People have been, been, been saying they listening and they just enjoying what we got going on right here. So we're going to get right into it. Um, as you can tell, we have a special guest in the building, uh, a good friend of the podcast. He, he's been a friend, but kind of off the camera. You see what I'm saying uh, by way of the one of the other co-hosts who could not be here today. Um, our co-host, as you can tell, Dr. Hater, a.k.a. Jackie, <laughs> could not be here. And so in her place, uh, and it's so interesting because the topic for the day goes right up. Like this, this brother, like God allowed it to happen this way because um, I don't think anybody else could speak to this topic better than this brother right here, this brother uh, who is the partner, uh, the life partner, the love of our co-host, who we're going to show love to. Hopefully she feels better, Jackie. Um, this brother's from Chicago, uh, Illinois. He is uh, an artist. He is a CEO. Um, he is a thinker, he is a philosopher, he is better known as the king of trolls, the king of Facebook. <laughs> like, he, he, he is the king of beef. What we're talking about today is beef, and he is the king of it. And that's why I feel like Jackie would have been good, but I don't know if Jackie brings beef like, like Kunle brings beef. So I, I, that's why I said it, because I was Not waiting beef. for the response. Right? Not beef. <laughs> Not beef. <laughs> <laughs> so so we just want to introduce uh, a good friend to the podcast. I've known this brother for a minute, man. And, and art together. Um, and he has a recent album that just dropped. Um, and so, you know, we'll definitely give him a chance to talk a little bit about that. The album has been doing very well, streaming all over the place. Um, you, as you probably heard, he's getting a couple royalties off of that. Things is looking good things is happening. So super proud of his brother, y'all. So show your love for my boy, Kool Lay. Appreciate y'all having me. Thank you for coming in at the, 
at at the at the last at the last second and hitting the last second shot. Yeah, yeah. we appreciate no that. We appreciate that. So yeah, yeah. Wife, wifey hit me up and said she wanted me to come through. So I know, I'm like, uh, now, you know, it's always good to get brownie points to the wife. You feel me? Okay. So, for sure. Yeah. For sure. Well, we we appreciate you greatly. Um, yo, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself for those who may or may not, uh, who may not know you, and for those who do, just to to reintroduce yourself. Yeah. Um. See, I am a graduate of the illustrious Oakwood University. Hey. Uh, oh. Yeah, some biochemistry. Um. Oh, okay. Let's see. I'm. Yeah, I'm getting my master's. I'll be done in May. And marketing, research, and analytics. Facts. Um, appreciate it. Have an album out. I've I've been working on music for about twenty years, but I I put out what I guess would be my debut album. I kind of like reinvented my sound. Um, and it seems like I've found my sound now. So I have a new project out called "Remember Me When This Is Over," which is a project I made during the pandemic. Um. And it's doing really well. It's out on all streaming platforms and whatnot. Uh, I am the creative director of Free Dope Creative, which is a platform for Black entrepreneurs and Black creatives, um, which is also doing really well right now. Um, so I'm very excited about that. Uh, I am the husband of Dr. Hayter, a.k.a. Jacqueline Forbes over lobby. Um, and... Yeah, I'm just I'm just here to to enjoy the festivities, and uh, you know do what I can to fill in that place. Yo, yo, we greatly appreciate it, y'all. We gonna we gonna definitely show uh put his links down and his info down so y'all could go check out check out uh, our boy uh, Kunle. He's doing great things in the digital space and creative space. So Amber, what's good? Talk to us. Hey, <laughs> do I need to do an introduction? Oh no, I'm doing the introduction to this entire conversation today. Okay, so y'all, we are in 2020, and 2020 has wrecked us so bad um, in so many ways that I feel like, and I've been seeing people in the internet land and just in life have begun to anthropomorphize 2020. That means to turn 2020 into a person, into something that we actually materialize and say, man, I hate you 2020. I don't like you. You, you upset me, blah, blah, blah. Um, I don't know if you all have seen this. All, I really don't like the commercial, the match.com commercial where 2020 is a woman and she's matched with the devil and they, they match. <laughs> And then they're like in love and everything. <laughs> and really? they're like, you know, some matches happen. It's an awful commercial. I think it's really poor marketing, but oh, wow. it's like, it's the idea that the devil in 2020 fell in love <laughs> and that they're a great match together. Um, but anyway, <laughs> that's what, that's what <laughs> it's kind of, I, I think that's the part that kind of gets me. Well, like, 2020 had to be a woman. Well, but 2020, of all women, she was. She's a white woman. And that could be that could be appropriate. <laughs> She's a young white woman, kind of looks looks fairly middle class. Um, looks like her name could be Karen. So could be, it might be actually could be Karen, could be Kelly Loeffler, could be uh, yeah. could be Betsy DeVos. Exactly. <laughs> Betsy, so it's like it's just like if you were to choose a figure to represent 2020, perhaps that's correct. However, all that's to say that we have, I think, people in this generation have feelings about 2020 as an entity because it's been so strong on us. And as people know, you know, um, just in in the annals of history, people get defined by well, generations get defined by significant events that happen when they're living. Uh, specifically, typically when they're like teenagers or 20s. But I do wonder that this generation, everyone who's alive right now, could be considered like the pandemic generation. And mm. so it makes me wonder, how will this pandemic generation respond to the pain of 2020? Like, how will we uh, process the beef that we have with 2020 because 2020 has done a lot of things it's a bad relationship it kept getting worse and so part of this conversation right now is to talk about 
beef, period. So like if we have beef for 2020, how can we get through the beef that we have for 2020? And that begs the question, how do we typically deal with beef in our lives anyway? How will we move? How do we typically get through bad situations with other people? Because that's probably also going to be how we get through the whole processing and dealing with our relationship with 2020 and everything that 2020 has done to us. So today we're going to talk about beef and forgiveness in the context of 2020. Um, but first, we're going to start with what is beef to begin with? How, like, where did beef come from? What is it? And then later we'll start thinking about how do you actually deal with beef? What is forgiveness? How do you, um, how soon is it? How soon is too soon to begin forgiving? All of that. So that is what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about personal beefs. Uh, also how we got through these beefs, grudges, the whole nine. Because we're hope hoping that all of us come 2021 have some perspective about how we deal with 2020 because it's it's like a bad breakup it's like it's you still feel the effects of 2020 in 2021 more than likely we're gonna feel it it's not just gonna be like a switch it's like it's still in your chest so that's where we're going Ooh, wow all right let's do this so john can you start can you start with us just saying what is beef what is beef um where did it come how, how did that song beef is when a nigga like you can't I, I knew it was coming <laughs> i knew it was coming <laughs> got it how that uh how that went beef is when a nigga like something i forgot i missed that show that was a good series that beef series um man i don't man beef beef is so i think i think beef is different from like holding a grudge right like like you can hold a grudge or you you know somebody can do you wrong that's one thing beef i think is bigger right beef is is when you know we i don't you know there's something that a person does to another person but what turns it from a grudge or i don't like you or i didn't like what you did to me to beef is when other like principles start getting involved and other people start getting involved and it becomes it 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 sometimes gets out of control because there are other there are other entities and it's almost like um like a concentric circle. You know what I'm saying? It it just it 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 grows into other things and gets um um it gets integrated into other parts of life. And then that's when it becomes beef, right? So I like like I think an example would be everybody was talking about the beef between Gucci and Jeezy. And the fact that Gucci and Jeezy less, you know, had, you know, they didn't have beef over a song, right? I know everybody talks about the So Icy song or whatever, and I'm not really sure exactly what happened. I don't know if they just didn't like each other, it was over some money, whatever. That's one thing, right? Um, typically, I think for men, you know, if, if, if we don't like somebody or, or another dude does us wrong, um, even if it's over money, I guess it depends on how much money, but sometimes that's still not enough for it to be beef. You know what I'm saying? If it's just like a back and forth thing or you just dirty or it's just somebody I can't trust. But I think beef is when it, when it, you know, when it gets to the point where now you have other people involved. Now my career is, 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 is hanging on the line. Now lives are at stake. Um, you know, reputation is at stake. More money is at stake. Um, you know, kids, you know what I'm saying? My children, like all these other different, like, I think that's when stuff becomes beef. You know what I'm saying? I think beef sometimes, mm -hmm. if we want to get all technical and like social or sociological, whatever, like it's more structural. You know what I'm saying? Now it's like bigger, mm -hmm. bigger entities involved as opposed to just two people not liking each other. Um, so that's that's what I think of when I think of like, I think of beef. And that's why beef is is a whole lot harder to, you know, like walk away from, you know what I'm saying? It's a whole lot right. harder to drop. It's a lot, it's, you know, and, and a lot of times with beef, people outside of it don't really, can't really understand all of it. I think that's, that's another thing about beef is like you and that person and the few people that's involved, they know, but people on the outside looking in and oh, why they got, why they da 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 da? Yeah, because it's not just issues, it's beef. You know what I'm saying? That's why, that's, that's what I think of.
I feel like that definition fits perfectly with 2020 because 2020 is just like, it's personal and then it also affects so many other things in your life. So it's like, it's affecting everything. So if 2020 was an entity, it's just like, okay, you started with me, you might have, you, you affected like my daily life in terms of who I can interact with, who I can't interact with, perhaps my job. I think everyone's for the most part jobs were affected in some kind of way. Um, it affected where you where you went. It affected travel plans. It affected dates. I know for for you, um, our our co-host, right, our guest co-host. It affected your wedding date. It affect it affected a whole lot of things, and it's an emotional toll. Like it's like you keep doing stuff, and then if we knew people who were directly affected by COVID, it's like it affected. <laughs> it's like 2020 was jam packed with like jab. I feel like that's another thing with beef that maybe is different from a grudge. It's like beef has a way of continuing. So it's just like, it can, it's like there might've been one infraction, but then like a little while later, it's like, oh, it's another one. And then it's another one. And that's what maintains the beef. And I think that was something that was very unique about 2020, where it just kept feeling like it's blow after blow after blow after blow. <laughs> and so it's like, you're maintaining my hatred for you. If, it, if, if you had stopped at COVID, that would have been enough. But then the summer happened with George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, Aubrey. Like, it was so many back-to-back -back things. And then the election. And then it just kept giving. And it's like, I, it's like we couldn't get over just this one thing. It just continued happening. And so it just makes me continue to feel like, yo, the feeling that, like, just, oh, my God. I just, <laughs> so speaking, speaking about, Beef. How do you feel, Kunle, in particular, about uh, how 2020 kind of affected, like, how, how, I remember seeing a post from you about, or was it, was it Jackie? Maybe it was Jackie, but about how, you know, having to change your wedding that really affected you. Like, how did that change or, like, affect your relationship to this year? Um... <clears throat> so 2020, 2020 and me clearly have beef. I, I can't wait until 2021 comes around. But I think, I think that for me personally, like having to change my wedding date kind of pushed everything. Cause like we had a plan, right? So like we were going to get, we're going to get married. Um, we're going to start building a family. Like she doesn't want to walk down the aisle. Uh, waddling so we were intentionally waiting until after the wedding <laughs> to start planning for a family so it's like now that we have to push the wedding back now we have to push the family back mm -hmm. um we're also talking about getting a house we we're not sure exactly where we're going to be in the next 20 uh 12 months so um it was just there was a, a lot of things that that kind of were kind of were contingent on um the wedding and things that we had planned in this year that have now been pushed back um and, you know, we're, we're ready to, like, you know, move on with lives. Like, we've been together for years now. We're ready to get into this, like, next phase of life. And it's, like, it's kind of paused everything. Um, even the project I put out, like, not something, like, I was working on other music prior to that. And I just put that out just because. But the stuff that I was working on, I was working on intentionally because I wanted to do music videos and I wanted to do, like, a tour and all of that. It's, like everything that 20 that was supposed to happen before 2020 has now been paused because of 2020. So, yeah, I mean, there's like a, a love hate relationship with 2020 because in, in one instance, it allowed me to take a step back and kind of redefine what I find important. Uh, give me time to do things that I probably didn't have time to do because I'm stuck in the house all day long. Um, but on the other end, it just paused a lot of things that I already had in motion. So, yeah. Yeah, I can, I can get that. that. That also makes me think about, I wonder if the, another part of beef, as you were defining it, John, that makes it particularly difficult is that typically, I feel like what makes beef interesting is that typically it's like, I feel like there's a respect level that happens in beef which makes it interesting so for example if we look at like um 
even the the clap like one of the classic ones like biggie and tupac right if we go all the way back there what for outsiders makes beef interesting is that we see these two artists as like being in the same caliber or whatever and i imagine oh, that okay. they both had there was at a point where they both had respect for each other at some point <laughs> so it's okay. like it's not it's like you can't necessarily say that they're not a good artist in some kind of way and so it's like there is this kind of thing that you kind of respect about them mm -hmm. and at the same time they're doing this other thing that you don't like and i feel like that's kind of what 2020 was too it's like in one way it's like you're you're awful i hate you and then another way it's like but there are some good things about you. <laughs> there are some good things that are happening. Right. And maybe that's what makes me even more angry about this whole situation because it's like a combination. And I know for me, one thing that I really had to grapple with this year is the concept of duality or even just like multiplicity where it's just like two things, two seemingly opposite things can completely exist at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like while the pandemic, is being awful there's george floyd all of this other stuff there's also like the beauty of looking at nature birds are chirping and you know the it's like the babbling brook is pleasant to my ears it's like there's completely a combination and for me one thing that happened in this year um was i um got into a beautiful new relationship and it's just like that's happening at, and it's blossoming and i'm feeling great and i'm learning about myself but at the same time all of this fire is around me. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's like, I feel like that's also what makes 2020 interesting because like you said, Kunle, it's like, okay, I did have some time to do some things that I didn't get a chance to do if it wasn't for all of this shit, you know? Mm -hmm. How did you all experience that? I just, I wanted to, to respond to something you said because I was so deep, like, like the respect level for beef. Like, that was so good because, um, and you talked about Biggie, you talked about Biggie and Tupac, but even Nas and Jay-Z, right? Like, Jay-Z and, and his response to Nas with Ether, right? And I, I mean, it's the same with Biggie and Tupac. Like, I imagine they were both extremely, like, really good MCs and really good at their craft. So, you know, it's, it's almost like the saying, like, lions don't respond to lambs. You know what I'm saying? Like, if a, you know what I'm saying? Like, if somebody come to you and somebody wants beef with you or somebody wants static with you, if they're not on your level, if you a lion, if you a king, if you a young guy, like, you're not going to respond to that. Like, I'm, this, this not even, it's, it's, you're not even on my radar. It's, it's not doing anything for me. In fact, it will help you more if I respond to you. So, it's, it's not, it's not worth it. It's not worth my time. But, mm -hmm. One of the reasons why Jay Z and Nas was such a, 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 a great um, hip hop battle, and Jay Z even talks about it, is because Nas is great. <laughs> Jay Z is great. So you have two great people, and now it's like, okay, I have to respond because if I don't, this could affect my career. Because if, if Nas wasn't who he was, or Jay Z wasn't who he was, it's not a threat to me. So the thing about beef is the person has to be a threat to you. And they're a threat to you if they have a certain level of respect, if they have a certain skill set, if they have a certain talent. You see what I'm saying? So there's a, there's a I think that's deep what you said. There's a certain um, respect level to beef, right? And so with that being said, it was the same way with 2020. Had this happened in 2017 or 2018, would we be as upset? Maybe not. But 2020 was so respected because everybody's like, I'm going into 2020. It's a new That's thing. It's a new vision. It's a new, it's a new thing. Oh, I'm so excited. And then, damn. So we had all this respect for 2020. We had all this love for 2020. This is going to be great for me. This is my chance to, to, to relearn, to redo, to, you know, this is my rebirth. This is my year I'm going to get married. This is my year I'm going to graduate. This is my year I'm going to do all these different things. And bam. This is my year, I'm gonna get money and then bam, job, bam. I can't have my wedding, bam. You know, all this stuff is happening. You know what I'm saying? And I think that's, I think that's a big reason why we got beef. It ain't just, it ain't just a grudge, like you said, with 2020 beef. <laughs> because I had respect for you. You was, you was here, you wasn't like 2017, 2018, 2013. It was 2020, you was a new decade. How you gonna do this to me? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> we going hard. For real. Oh yeah, like we like we on some raw raw shit with this because like we I got 
you you like you gotta square up in 2020 now. You know what right. I'm saying? You got we gotta yeah. square up. You know what I'm saying? How can I forgive you for this? You know what I'm saying? Right. That's right, all right. 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 That's crazy. Yeah, like I, I think like I think that I, I agree with you because like my at least my definition of beef would be circled around essentially it being established tension. So it's like there has to me there has to be tension on both sides. So it's like 2020 has clearly shown me that she does not like me. I also do not like you. Right. So it's like 2019. Yeah, it's like and it's like you keep you keep doing things to add to this beef. So it's like you're only building up the reasons why I don't like you more and more. So it's kind of like um, with uh, when Drake and Joe Budden were supposedly beefing. Nobody considered that a beef because Drake was not responding to Joe Budden. Like, but when Drake was responding to Meek, we saw that as a beef because we understood that like both sides didn't like each other. And that's kind of how I feel about 2020. It's like, I do not like you, you do not like me. So right. yes, we are beefy. And if I see you in the streets, it's on. It's on site. <laughs> it's on site. <laughs> it has to that's be. perfect. <laughs> I love the way y'all said that. John, just it's so true. Like we had so many expectations. It's just like it's like because I had all these expectations with you, I'm especially mad that you that you completely fell off. Like it right. and I think about like all of us were so ready to get out of 2019 because 2019 seemed awful. And right. we were just like, okay, deal with 2019. 2020 is my gear. And even I think, you know, for all the earthy people, the people who are into supreme mathematics and stuff, 2020 is a numerically significant year. If felt like something significant was happen was going to happen this year. Right. And yet it it did, but not in any of the ways that we wanted. We were hoping for some <laughs> right. kind of, I don't know, some type of beautiful experience, some type of newness, you know, but it really began to feel more like Armageddon. And like we were fighting for our lives in various ways. Like it totally was not expected. So with that, now that we've really understood, like, okay, we do have legitimate beef for 2020, let's look at like how have we dealt with beef in our lives or how have we witnessed beef being dealt with in other people's lives like how do we like because we cannot hold on to this forever we can't <laughs> and we we must work through this uh, because we do not want to hold this in our chest especially as black people uh we can't we can't hold this so we we must work through it so how do we do this we do it by like looking at other people like how did they work through beef how have we worked through beef so have either of you ever had beef with somebody and if so, how did how did you work through it, or do you still have beef with them? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I've I've clearly had beef with people. Like I, I mean, I'm not the most likable <laughs> person. So, <laughs> like, say, yeah, I'm just. Yeah. Tell us more. I've definitely had beef. And, and, and I'll elaborate. Say, like he be a real cool right now. Because, <laughs> I think because he on our screen just. But let me tell y'all. Kool Aid be bringing, he be with the, <laughs> like, he be bringing the heat. Can you elaborate? Yeah, like you don't have um, to say the names. No, nah, no, nah, I'm not. You know, Keisha, you out there? If you, no, nah, I'm just playing. Um, <laughs> no, nah, but um, it just it really depends on on how much that person meant to me before the beef existed. Mm. So like, I've had beef with niggas in the club. Like, but I mean, that, that's not gonna last past us leaving the club. Um, I've had beef with like, some of my homeboys. I remember I had beef with one of my boys cause we was living together. And um, you know, he was just doing some foul stuff in the crib. And I, it, I thought we was going we was going to end in fisticuffs, honestly, because you know we just we kept bumping heads, and I was like, man, I'm finna move out. I had my, the, the TV in the front room was my TV, and I took it out and put it in my room. I was like, well, fine, ain't nobody watching the big TV. Y'all can use y'all little twenty inch. Like we was like we was legit beefing, and I, it took us probably like almost a year to like to like get back to where we were. Um, mm. But that was like one of that's still one of my closest friends to this day. So it's like. When it comes to to how do you deal with beef, I think it all depends on whether you feel like that relationship is manageable, which I don't know how that really works as it relates to 2020, 
because honestly, I'm just waiting for 2020 to leave. Like I'm completely hoping that I will erase the memory of 2020. Um, just complete. Like once 2021, like there's 2019 and then there's 2021, and that's how it is in my. <laughs> head. So, but like as it relates, <laughs> as it relates to like physical relationships, I don't. I think that like pe- people who matter, I'm more willing to like figure out how we can grill this beef and eat it and be done with it. But for other, like, I mean, there's honestly, there's people to, nah, I shouldn't say that. Like, Cause I, I don't think I really have beef with it. There might be people who still have beef with me, but I don't, I don't really, I can't, I can't say that I have beef with anybody. Cause it's like, either I'm just going to like dismiss it or we going to figure out how to work through it. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, um, I'm gonna be honest. I don't think I've ever had beef. I've I've had grudges. I've had issues with people before. Um, I don't think I've ever had beef. So I can I can give you a couple of examples. There was one example I remember one time I was um I was I was with my homeboys and we was like all this was like high school. Um, we was all at one of my dog's crib or whatever and. Um, one of my homeboys, um, and, and these, and these not no, you know, no soft type of dudes. Like I'm, they're not gangsters or thugs or nothing like that, but well, well, depend anyway, these, just, <laughs> these, 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 these some dudes, you know what I'm saying? But, but we was all chilling. We was like, and then we got into a conversation. One of my homeboys, um, had got into it with my other homeboy, baby mama. And it was it got into like a, a a yelling match and it was almost to the point where my homeboy was getting ready to slap my other homeboy and baby mama now my homeboy and his baby mama didn't get along for real um but he was like bruh if you would have put your hands on her dog it's 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 like me and you we gonna have to do what we gotta do and we all really really close since we was young but he was like but it's just certain lines you just can't cross. And I got to do what I got to do as a man. I, after we do what we do, after we bloody each other nose, punch each other face in, do everything that we got to do, we're going to stop. We're going to be good again. But at this moment, it's going to get real ugly. And that's just what it is. And 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 that's kind of how I grew up. Like, as men, I don't really – and I think Jackie even asked this question on the live. Um, she said, John just said something interesting about how men handle beef. Do, do y'all think men and women handle beef differently? And I, I can't speak to how women handle beef, but I know for men, depending on the situation and depending on what lines are crossed, beef can be handled or well, I don't know if it's beef as opposed to grudges can be handled real quick. Now it's intense and it's ugly. And sometimes, you know, if it's a grudge, it can be handled real quick, intense, sometimes a minute, two minutes, and then we'd be good. If it's beef, it could be a little bit longer sometimes. And depending on the situations and stuff like that, it could, it could, you know, end up costing people's lives. But I, I think for guys, um, it's, it's really, really intense, but only for a short period of time. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, that's how I, I've always kind of known that kind of stuff to happen um, when it comes to grudges or, you know, baby beef. With, with 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 guys um i know for me i've had people do me wrong do me dirty and usually the way in which i handle it i, I remember and so i end up going inward and so i just kind of remove myself from those people you know what i'm saying um i don't trust those people and they and they feel it and they know it it don't mean i'm gonna do you dirty um i think there was one time well i mean i've gotten in fights before but there was one time i think the last time i was really about to get in a fight it was at oakwood and it was um, one of my sweet mates. He was he was acting crazy, and this was shortly after I got into Oakwood. So I'm still going through a I'm, I'm still transitioning into going to a different space in my life, and so I was going back to that other space. And I remember I, I ran in my room. I had grabbed some sticks because I was getting ready to go and beat his head in with these sticks, and um, and and my roommate grabbed me. And he was like, don't do it. He was like, bro, you in school, nigga. Like, <laughs> like you like you going somewhere. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't wanna, you don't wanna get kicked out. You don't wanna mess up your life over this. So he was like, just mm-hmm. just chill, you know. And so and 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 I did, and I, I remember like sitting at Edwards Hall and I was I was I was angry. I'm mad, I'm red, I'm sweating, I'm tears, everything. And then I finally like calmed all the way down and like thought through everything. You know what I'm saying? 
Because again, it would have been intense, but then after that, it would have been over. But the repercussions could have been you get in trouble, you get kicked out of school, now you don't have a degree, and now the rest of your life is altered because of a of a situation. You know what I'm saying? And so um, it's like stuff like that, I think. And then, and from that moment over time, I've been better in terms of dealing with grudges and dealing with issues that I've had with people. Now, when it comes to like, but again, when I was talking about beef, I'm thinking like beef is bigger than the grudges. And that's why I say, I don't think I've ever had beef to on a structure. When I think of beef, like I got beef with like George Zimmerman. You know what I'm saying? Like if I ever see George Zimmerman and I probably shouldn't say what I would do because then it could it could get back, you know what I'm saying, online. But you could imagine, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Just like, now that's good right. because it's like, it's bigger than just, you know, you got issues with a person like, it's, it's structural, it's racism, it's loss of lives. Like I got beef with what white people have done to black people. You know what I'm saying? Like that's when I, that's what I think of. Like that's ongoing. That's something that, and I guess it kind of leads to another part of the discussion. Um, I think I think grudges can be forgiven. You know what I'm saying? And grudges can sometimes be forgiven quickly. But beef, I think to a certain level, beef doesn't have to be forgiven. You know what I'm saying? I don't think we need to, or I think we need to rethink what we think, how we look at forgiveness when it comes to like beef. You know what I'm saying? When we right. when it comes to like big. So like I don't think the Jews need to forgive the Germans, <laughs> you know. Like I think that's that's beef. You know what I'm saying? Like no, like no. There's no forgiveness from that. It doesn't mean it has to hold you down or weigh you down or stop you from being a better person. But I think I I, I think that we need to rethink. You know what I'm saying? That kind of you know like how we move through um, beef versus grudges. You know what I'm saying? And then what kind of beef and 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 what has happened historically? You know. And so on grudges, on the grudges sense, you know, that's how I've handled grudges in the past. And that's how I've seen grudges handled in the past from a gender standpoint. But when it comes to beef and how big that beef is, some people, you know, believe that, you know, you can forgive and you should forgive. And maybe that works for some people. But I think for me, depending on what it is, I don't think we have to forgive. I don't think it's necessary. Um, or if we do, like, what does it mean? Like, what do we mean when we say we forgive? Are we just saying like, we're not gonna think about it no more. We're just gonna move past it. Or, or are we gonna forget? You know what I'm saying? Or do we really forgive? And are we forgiving because we feel like we don't have the power to do anything about it? Or are we forgiving because we really do forgive that person? You know what I'm saying? Those are just some of the things I think about. So I, um, so one, I wanna say, I think Jackie's question is a really good question about like, do men and women deal with forgiveness and holding grudges and beef differently? And I don't, I feel like that we probably do in some ways. And, but I feel like that would be a whole nother conversation for another podcast. And we might have to save that. As I was listening to you all talk though, um, I also don't really have too many beefs in my, beef, beefs? Do you use beef? What's the plural of beef? 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 beef. Oh, yeah. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> it's like sheep and <laughs> No. Sheep and <laughs> so I don't have too many beefs in my life either, but I thought it was interesting to listen to you all describe how you might have dealt with it. And one, I feel like, Kuma, you were saying, basically, like, you take the TV out of the room, put it in yours. That's pettiness. Absolutely. I think a response to beef always kind of is pettiness. So, and so that's why, you know, people put out tracks and they'll say, like, little petty remarks. If you were thinking about rap beefs. It's like you say little petty things or you just do little things or... <laughs> you just do things to in some way embarrass the other person or put the other person in like an uncomfortable or vulnerable position because you like basically it's a power move so or it's like you take a power move or you something like that so that's interesting and I feel like the way that um people have been dealing with talking about 2020 is in petty ways it's like I can't wait till that bitch leave or just like how you said um uh, Kool-Aid like 2020 never happened. 2019, 2021, <laughs> bitch, you don't exist. You know, it's, so, it's like, I feel like that's the way that uh, we will try to just deal with talking about 2020 and just basically just straight disrespecting her, just, just disrespecting 2020 as much as we can. I feel like that is one way of moving past it. But to your question, John, which I think this is the transition into where we're, where we're going, it's like, how do we forgive a beef like because it is I think it's more 
I think when people look at people who have had these, people give more credit to the person who gave the olive branch first, or they say like, this is the mature move. So for example, with Jeezy and Gucci Mane, when they were like, oh, he invited him to do it. It's just like, if he had rejected the olive branch, people would say, what would people say then? You know, the people who are squashing the beef, something about squashing it feels important. It feels like the mature thing. It feels like the evolved thing to do. And so, but Black people in particular have a complicated relationship with forgiveness and letting go of beef. So just like you said, John, for you, you consider like what white people have done to Black people for the longest as like, that's a longstanding beef. That's not just something that we're just going to be like, okay, white people, because but at the same time, that seems to be expected, particularly of Black people, when there is a, a, an infraction made. So we think about both of John's brother hugging uh, that, that woman, right? <laughs> and so we had an issue with that. Or we think about when people were trying to, like, they forgive a murderer very quickly. And we're like, you know, why do Black people seem to always have to be the ones forgiving a situation so quickly? Like, it's incumbent upon Black people to do that. So I think we have a complicated relationship with forgiveness because in one way, it's just like, how do we move through this? How do we move past this and not hold it in our chest? And at the same time, how do we hold somebody or something accountable for the pain that they have caused? Mm -hmm. So I think in particular, we have a different kind of relationship to this. I'm going to share a definition of forgiveness for us to think about um, as we talk about all of this. So because, John, you said, what is the difference between like forgiveness and just something else? I forgot what you said, but yeah. Forgiveness is the process, and this is from a book called Forgive to Live by Dr. Dick Tibbetts, which I really felt like actually helped me learn more about forgiveness. Um, and it was a reframing for me that was helpful. So forgiveness is the process of reframing one's anger and hurt from the past with the goal of recovering one's peace in the present and revitalizing one's purpose and hopes for the future. I'll say that again. Forgiveness is the process of reframing one's anger and hurt from the past with the goal of recovering one's peace in the present and revitalizing one's purpose and hopes for the future. So with that forgiveness, really more so is a reframing of something that has happened. It's not necessarily forgetting what happened. It's not giving up past to what happened it's a reframing of like saying what is the story i've told myself about this or about this situation so that i can have peace in the present mm -hmm. and so that my future is not negatively affected by how i feel about that past that is the that is for me has been a good working definition of forgiveness. How did how do you all feel about that? I, I, oh my bad. You like you something. Something. Yeah, Kula, you like you was gonna say something. Uh yeah. So I think that I think that like when I look at, at different periods of my life, I think that based off that definition, the root was understanding um like in my younger days how i would forgive or get past a beef who was usually fighting especially well at least if it was guys it was fighting but most of the time like if like if we were friends before that we could be friends after that because we came to an understanding like either you beat my ass i beat your ass i can't beat you up so let's move past like we have an understanding as an adult like talking through your words um you know this is what i was feeling this is what you were feeling we come to an understanding so i i just think that that based off that definition um how i've processed forgiveness is based on understanding the other party or the two parties understanding each other mm. yeah yeah i'll i'll I agree with you, Kunle, in that it's that understanding which I think leads to what what Amber is saying about I think that's the key to to reframing. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, um, that's the part I think that stuck out to me is like, when you forgive is when you think about whatever happened differently. It's not excusing. It's not saying it was okay. Um, and, and for me, it's not even saying that, like you said, like I still won't beat your ass. You know what I'm saying? Or I still don't, or like I still don't like you. Or I still don't trust you. Um, but the forgiveness is really just the rethinking. Like that's the forgiveness part. And I like that. Like, I feel better about that because oftentimes forgiveness is couched in, in this, it, it's told to the oppressed, oppressed people, you know, forgive to just let, let things go, let people continue to do what they're doing to you. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and because you, and it's going to help you feel better because now you feel like you have this moral superiority over this actual superiority. You see what I'm saying? So, oh, well, I can't actually, you know, hurt this person or I can't actually get back at this person, but morally I'm better because I forgave and things are going to be better in heaven or in the hereafter or whatever. And, and things are work better for me later on because I took this moral high ground. You know what Michelle Obama says, when they go low, we go high. Um, but I, but, you know, and of course, this is Street Academy, so we blend, you know, we blend, you know, these kind of conversations with like, you know, theories and, and stuff like that. And if we think about Marxist conflict theory, right, Marxist conflict theory says that, you know, um, it is it is through conflict that we receive, that, that we get social change. It is through conflict, um, typically between the poor and the rich, that we actually move forward in society, so we should embrace conflict. You know what I'm saying? Because that is how change occurs. And in a lot of ways, especially in America, that is how change occurs. Because America's born out of violence. America's born out of conflict. And so America only understands conflict. America doesn't understand forgiveness. You see what I'm saying? Um, and so because of that, in order for us to get to a better place, there has to be some beef. <laughs> beef, beef is the only way we move forward in America. <laughs> you know, like, like, like beef is the foundation of this country, bro. So it's mm -hmm. like, but I like that forgiveness piece you was talking about because the forgiveness piece says even, even, even while, even, even while I got beef with you, even while I'm punching your face in, even while we're going to war with each other, I'm, I'm forgiving you because I'm already rethinking this thing. I've already reframed it. So. Mm -hmm. So so I'm forgiving you while I'm beating your ass. You know what I'm saying? Like that's kind of deep to me. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's how I think. About it. One important thing too that I learned about when reading in this book, which was really helpful, because there are myths about forgiveness. Definitely, one myth is that forgiveness means to forget. It means to that I don't remember what happened. I want to like actively try to not remember. I'm not going to call that up i'm not going to bring that up it's just this mystical ability to have amnesia um that's not what forgiveness is it's to say like i recall this story and i'm choosing to think about it in this specific way i'm going to reframe the way that i think about it now so that i can have peace it's not helpful to act like it didn't happen mm -hmm. that's not the point another myth about forgiveness is that you have to reconcile reconciliation is not right. forgiveness they do not equal the same thing because I might be able to reframe a scenario from the past. I don't have to then say, okay, well, I must be in a relationship with this person now because I've reframed the story. So whether it mm -hmm. was with a parent or with an ex or with somebody you had another type of beef with, it's like, for example, with 2020, we don't have to act like 2020 in one way, even though this is different from what Kunle was saying, I don't have to necessarily act like 2020 didn't happen. I can say that it happened. I don't have to say I loved 2020 though. I don't have to say that, you know, 2020 was, you know, I, I don't necessarily have to say like, you know, only I will only recall the good things that happened there. It's just like, I can recall both of them and choose to maintain my peace when I think about all of the different types of things that happened in 2020. Because I'm in, in a place where as a human being, I accept 
that good and bad happens. However, I want to define those things. I accept that, you know, rain, if we want to get biblical, rain falls on the just and the unjust. Like I accept that life hat is a mixed bag and I know that I can choose to walk, continue to walk forward from that. One thing I like, I'm looking at the comments on Facebook, um, Shafiq Rashid said, there's a difference between being at peace with having an enemy and having a grudge that is detriment to you. I'm perfectly, perfectly at peace with the enemies I have and will have. And mm -hmm. I think that's interesting to be able to say, you know, I can have peace about that being about 2020 having been an enemy. <laughs> like mm -hmm. I can, I don't, I'm not moving forward with like resentment because that's one part of forgiveness that is important forgiveness covers resentment like it will it minimizes the resentment that you have that you feel because resentment in your body in your chest in your mind that's not something good to hold on to that will pull you down that will hurt you another way that people talk about forgiveness is when you know you are holding hot coals in your hand thinking that it's going to harm the other person you know like you have these coals these hot coals that you want to throw or these stones that you want to throw at someone else but you're holding them and they're actually hurting you so it's just like for a part of forgiveness is to say, like, I don't have, I'm not holding anything towards this situation. I'm free. I'm at peace. And yet I don't have to reconcile with this. I don't have to act like it didn't happen. I'm going to have peace with the fact that I do not like that thing, or I don't appreciate it, or I don't have respect for it. I think there's something about us being able to know ourselves when we're able to say, yes, this thing was my enemy. Yes, I completely disagree with this thing. And I'm okay with that. It's not a moral high ground to say, I don't have beef with anybody. I don't think that's necessarily, I, I think people want to assume that that is, that means like, oh, you're a, you're a peacemaker, you're a pacifist, or you, you know, you're a really evolved person if you just don't have any issue with anyone. I don't really think that that's um, or anyone or anything because just like we were all saying we don't necessarily have an active beef with anybody but I believe we have beef with things and ideas and concepts because that shows that we all have that we have boundaries that we do have values that we believe in and, and things that we are against and I think that's fair so I feel like all of that just comes together with this concept of being able to reframe a story so that I can have peace in the present it's not about holding on to like harmful feelings about something or someone. I, I had a question regarding that. Like, how does that, how does that work? Well, let me, let me preface this with, if this is like not part of y'all platform, then you know, you could just erase this, this conversation. But I was going to ask, how does this, this concept of forgiveness um, and as it relates to peace, identify with how you feel about white folks because i know for me personally like even like the the idea you saying with like the hot coals like i can't let these hot coals down because i'm not at peace with the way the white folks are treated black folks in america so it's like how do you how do you kind of like make those two concepts align yeah honestly i had a conversation with my homegirls about this just last week <laughs> Because they were like, Amber, what's your issue? And I'm like, I don't trust most white people. Um, and uh, I thought I brought up the Muhammad Ali clip that I'm sure some of you all have seen, which is where he's like, you know, if a bunch of snakes come into the room, it's not like I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to just like welcome all the snakes if they have into mm -hmm. I me. If there are a few of them, even if there are a few of them that, <laughs> that are like, no, they're friendly snakes. I'm not just going to be like, Snakes come in. I I agree with that <laughs> way of thinking about yeah, exactly. white people. I think a lot of white people, I think there are some good white people out there. Absolutely. <laughs> I think there are wonderful, peacemaking, loving white folks. And by and large, there are it, it seems to be, as I perceive it in the world, as I perceive it through the history of the entire planet, it seems to be that there are more white people who do have it out for people like me and that they do have venom that's directed at people like me. So I'm not going to be naive to think that more than likely out of just looking at data and not trying to be naive that I can't necessarily trust a individual with this phenotype or with this experience because this is what they represent and this is what they have continued to represent. So 
how do I like try to, I'm, I'm not going to just like blindly trust a bunch of white people. And at the same time, I'm not also going to blindly trust anybody at this point, because we also know that it's not just white people. It's, you know, you know, who, whoever the hell else in your life. It's not like just because a person is black, I'm going to be like brother or sister. Although I do do that more now than I think ever before. I'm like my brother, my sister, you know, yeah. However, <laughs> because <it's, laughs> I feel like what gives me peace right now is to moderate my trust of white people. And that's what, how I'm trying not to hurt myself with rage because I'm like, I'm open to a degree to be, to trusting. No, 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 no. It's, it's, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Okay, let's see. I, and, and this is a working practice, okay, that I'm trying to, when I think about white people, right, because my, one of my friends got on me, she was like, well, you know, maybe Amber, if you were around more white people since you were a child, because her question was this, she said, like, when was the first moment when you realized that you needed to not trust white people, and I was like, it was actually when I went up to school in Cambridge, which was when I was like 27, my other friend said it was when she was in kindergarten with her kindergarten teacher, and so my friend is like, you know, uh, I'm like, actually, I'm very, I'm very thankful that I haven't had to be mistrusting of white people since that young. Like, I'm, I feel it a privilege that I just learned this, you know, or that I just started mistrusting. I don't feel like it's like some kind of privilege to have known more white people when, since I was younger so that I could have a, a, a better experience with them or to trust them more. That doesn't do anything for me. I don't, I don't need to. I didn't, I don't need to have known more white people so that I could be more exposed, even though that goes against the idea of stereotype threat and perhaps a part of the issue with so many white people is that they haven't been exposed to enough black people since they were children. And so they do have this developing stereotype against them, whatever, all that's to say, I don't want white people to occupy my imagination at all. And so really when I get down to answering your right. question, when I get down to answer your question, and this is what, what even happened in the conversation with my friends, I don't want them to be in my imagination as a factor. Whiteness, white people, I don't really want to talk about it. I want to free myself to imagine my world full of blackity black people and put other people who love blackity black people. And however that happens is how that happens. I don't really want to process my feelings about white people because that means they're in my mind. That's actually how I feel about it. So it's like when I think about the rage that I feel about white people, to me, that's like I don't even want to have rage at all against them because I don't want them to occupy my imagination because that's they that is an oppressive force in my imagination. And I feel like black people have to decent need to learn how to decenter white people, period, in all of our conversations. I don't want to talk about it. That's what I feel. That's fair. That, but I'm working through that. <laughs> <laughs> Because white people are so much a part of our conversation, even with the, what I recently started feeling was, even with that term BIPOC, I hate that term. You know why I hate that term? What does that even mean? You keep saying it, but what does that mean? It's black indigenous people of color. You know why I hate that? Okay. Because how do you group on any, on any stretch of the ma imagination? So, such a... In, multitude of cultures together by calling them black indigenous people of color. It's more of us than it is of white folks. Really, that's just saying non-white. It, again, it's just trying to find a way to not say white. I'm so tired of that. Like, how, how dare you put people of color in one category? It's way more of us. It's way, it, 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 it is baffling. It is completely dehumanizing and disrespectful to just say people of color. What do you mean people of color? Do you even know how many types of black people there are? How many types of indigenous people there are? How many other, like, what are we, people of color, is it Asian Americans? You know, all of the different countries in Asia, India, Cambodia, Japanese, Japan, China, Russia, even hell. If, if, am I considering a Russian a person of color? Mm. No. Anyway, I, all of this makes me mad. Um, yeah, I'm mad. <laughs> I'm just, I'm trying to work through it though. Just like you, it's like, yes, this is something I'm working towards in terms of like being at peace. So I'm still working through it. But to me, for, for me, the way I'm trying to have peace about the anger that I feel like the coals that, that I feel about white people is to just release it. Cause I don't want to, I don't want to have it. Mm. I don't, I don't want to have it at all.
I don't want them. I don't want them in my mind. I know they have to be there. Maybe that's unrealistic, but like literally, I'm working towards that. Shoot for the stars, you'll reach the trees. So yeah, that's what I'm going for. Complete. Like I don't want to think about y'all. I, I wanted to, and I wanted to even bring up this this um, awesome, <laughs> this this one dynamic too, because I think region and space and place plays a role. Um, you, Amber, growing up in Atlanta, you, Kunle, growing up in Chicago, so I don't know how often you came across, both of y'all came across black, white people like that, but I know both of those, both of those cities are very segregated cities in, in, in the research, right? Chicago is very segregated. You have predominant black, whole black sides of town um, where it's possible for you to move, move about life and not really interact with white people much. And it's even more in Atlanta. Like Atlanta's, I mean, you, you know, in Atlanta, you could literally go your entire life and somebody asks you, did you really interact with white people? And you'd be like, no, no, no not really. Maybe at the store, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you just don't, you know what I mean? And, and to some people, there could be a certain level of privilege there. You know what I'm saying? To not even have to have them on your radar until you, you know, like you said, Amber, until you literally... You left Atlanta, you went to an HBCU, then you went to Cambridge at 27, and that is when you really had substantial interactions with white people. And I don't know, Kunle, if, if that's your story, uh, and maybe you could speak to this, but I know for me growing up in Jacksonville, Florida, I did have interactions with white people. And so, really um, had some interactions with white people. What happened? And I don't know, Kunle, if that's your story. Uh, and maybe you could speak to this. Oh, that's you. Oh, that's I'm like, when did somebody else get on here? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's my computer. Oh, I, I was like, like, what happened? I'm looking back at my. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, but for me, it was it was different because I had, you know, I went to school with white people, even in elementary school and that sort of thing. Even though my neighborhood was predominantly black, um, so I, I had to some degree interactions with white people. So I understood very early at nine years old the concept of race. I remember one of my first fights was with a white boy because he said something racist to me. And I was not, I was in the fourth grade and I got this, I got this dude hemmed up on the wall. And, and you know what I'm saying, in fourth grade. So, you know, it like, I just, I remember that, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so, and, and so I think that that kind of plays a role in, in, you know, beef and conflict, particularly from a racial standpoint. And I, I see that um, Jackie even said, she said, let's go back to the Marx ideology of embracing conflict. Um, because I think if she was here, she would probably want us to stay there. Like, yeah, let's talk about this. You know, Jack, Jackie, be with, <laughs> Jackie be with the shit. So she'd be like, yeah, let's stay. I like this. Um, but, you know, I, I think it even leads to this, this conversation around the vaccine, right? So now the vaccine is, is, is coming up. And now people are like, you know, I've been seeing more and more black people online saying, go ahead and take the vaccine. And, uh, but of course, most of us is like, mm -mm, I remember Tuskegee. or I heard about Tuskegee. I know about <laughs> Sims. Not you know what I'm saying? going to happen. Yeah. And all of, <laughs> all of the um, uh, experiments he did on black people, specifically black women, J. Marion Sims, the father of gynecology, Tuskegee experiment, all the way down to Serena Williams almost dying giving birth to her child, Kim Porter, her life, you know, she's, she's no longer here with us. P part of the reason is because of the racism and sexism in the medical industry, right? She told the doctors that something was wrong with her. They didn't believe her. You know what I'm saying? So it was like all of these different things that are happening. Um, now you want us, <laughs> black people, to just be so open to taking this vaccine. No, why? Because we remember conflict. We, 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 we got beef. With the medical industry, we got beef with white folks in the medical industry. We got beef with doctors. We embrace this. We understand this. And, 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 and these type of things we remember. And so, yes, it's causing us now to say, we're not sure if we want to take this vaccine. And yeah, Barack Obama's like, well, I'll take the vaccine on, you know what I'm saying, on TV. And yeah, a black woman created it. I don't care. Y'all have used black women. Y'all have <laughs> used black people as puppets this whole time. What does that mean? That don't mean nothing. We are smarter than that. So we understand, like, you can't do people dirty for decades and centuries and centuries 
and not all of a sudden expect people to trust you when now your life is in danger and there's been a whole pandemic and now you like black people and other black people are like, come on, just no, no. Like it, it's, it's it, like, <laughs> no it <makes> sense. <laughs> like you can't just expect people in one year because of a pandemic to forget, you know, years and years of medical apartheid and, and, and okay. structural racism. Y'all check out Harry Washington's medical apartheid. Check out Dorothy Roberts killing the black body. All of these are books that have been written about the things that I'm talking about. You understand what I'm saying? So yeah, that's conflict. That's beef that we remember that we still got. So it's beef true. is real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's real. And 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 so I, I don't know how, how we gonna get past. I don't know how we gonna get us to trust the medical industry and get a lot of black people to take the vaccine, but we have a good reason for it. And white people have only themselves and the white systems have only themselves to blame. Had you not done this for so long, then getting to this point, maybe we'd be more open to it. But you only have yourselves to blame for that because of what has been done to us. You know what I'm saying? So I don't think black people should look at other black people and get mad at us for whether we decide or, or, or decide not to take the vaccine because it's not because of what we've done to each other. Does that make sense? Absolutely. We're not here to forget. People keep sending me that thing. My bad. Oh, no, go, go, go. No, I was just saying people keep people keep sending me that that vaccine because if I'm not mistaken, it was a Nigerian woman who mm-hmm. either created it or was like the first person to take it or something like that. And they was like, "Well, that's your people, so like you should be good with it." I was like, "Uh, <laughs> no, nah, that's not how this works. <laughs> that's not how that works." <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's gonna be. Like for me, for me to take the vaccine, it's it's gonna be a couple years. It's gonna be because I need to see. Because, see, first of all, what you're not going to do is have me be your lab rat. I'm not going to be your test dummy. All these white folks can take it. And then, you know, maybe some some white presenting folks. Like, it's going to be a long time before my black ass take this this vaccine. <laughs> like, so, um, I ain't, I ain't with, you know, like, and, and if everything, if everything turns out cool, sure, I take it. But, like, being on the front line to take something that's experimental, Nah, man, y'all have done a whole lot of experiments on black people, and it's not going to be another one. Right. Not going to happen. Not this time. Not in 2020, the year of the devil. No, <laughs> sir. No. No. That's funny. I feel no. like, I, John, I love how you brought that up, just connecting it back to, like, our beef, white, I mean, black people's beef with white people. It's like, we're just not just going to forget. that. That is not how it works. It's, it's like a part of being, right. I think, and I would say, like, my goal is to be evolved and mature and all of that. And I think a part of that is learning from the past. And how do I say, like, this happened and there hasn't been evidence that that has changed, like, in terms of the medical industry's relationship to Black people. That hasn't changed in a, in a, to the degree that I would like to have seen it. And so since it hasn't, this is, this is how I am going to operate on that. And I don't necessarily, and, and I think with that, it's like, I don't think any of us are saying we're not open to seeing the the white medical establishment change. It's like, if you all are willing to change and be more open about your change, I'm open to trusting you more. I don't want to like continue to not trust you, but I'm going to use my mistrust as a way to protect myself. This is protection. Right. And what I, what I learned some years ago, just in my personal life, is that I felt like I gave trust out way too easily. It's just like I just assumed that this was a trustworthy person, or I would want to really more, more so what it was. I would want to present myself as a trusting person, not just a skeptic, or not just like someone who's just like side eyeing everybody. So, but I, what I realized is like trust is something to be earned. It is something to be earned. And so I think even with that, forgiveness is probably something to be earned as well. It is a process that we have, but it's not something that doesn't have some type of reciprocal, I mean, some type of reciprocity factor. Well, no, 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 not forgiveness. Reconciliation, that's what I mean. Reconciliation and trust have to be earned. Forgiveness is a personal process um, where I can say, you know, white people, I don't trust you and I'm at peace with not trusting you. Going back to the comment from, what was his name? Um, Shiv. The, the guy, yeah, the 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 fact that it's just like I'm at peace with not trusting you about this because I've learned and I'm fine with that. Like, because you cannot trust everybody. Um, and and in order for me to reckon, want to reconcile, 
that's going to have to be earned. <laughs> that's going to have to show something. That is where there will be there will be there will be needed some type of reciprocity. So I know we're coming to a close now, and so I think in our last our last things that we need to that I would like for us to just kind of mention is um, what do you think if forgiveness could be the thing to kind of like help us get through the beef of 2020? What would be what would you say is like your antidote? to this like how do we, what how would you get through this beef for 2020 now that we're at the end of it and we're going into 2021 what's like one or two things that you feel will be your way of like squashing the beef that you have with 2020 how would i squash the beef the beef <laughs> i sound like such an old person how would you <laughs> squash the beef that you have with twins? And what are one or two things oh, that you're going to say that no more? I don't know. Just feels, <laughs> the way I said it, it just feels like an old person. <laughs> How are you going to squash the beef that you have with 2020? Um, I think, like, from a, a relationship standpoint, you often hear that um, change is like, like, change behavior or changed actions, I guess, is like one of the ways that you can show that you're truly sorry. So I think that if 2020 <laughs> is actually sorry, that 2021 will look vastly different. Um, so <laughs> I think I think that's how, yeah, I think that's how this this beef can be squashes, you know, my wedding has been pushed to 2021. If my wedding is magnificent, um, you know, COVID has been wrecking lives. If COVID can somehow cease to exist, um, you know, just just all the things that 2020 was supposed to bring, if we just move that to 2021, I think that I'll be able to get over 2020. But if 20, if 2021 is 2020 junior, it's only going to make 2020 look worse. Mm. So, yeah. That's a good point. That's that was well said. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I think to even extend that too, like, I, so I know for me, 2020, there was some good things that happened for me in 2020. Um, praise God, my money really didn't, wasn't really affected, you know, in a negative way in 2020. Um, but there were also some some bad things um, and some traumatic things that happened for me in 2020. And so because of that, I've had to go on a journey of redefining myself and being reborn and, and, and being bold and being courageous and a, a very strong faith journey that I've had to go on this year. And so if, if, and I, and although I hate the fact of the things that I've had to go through in 2020, um, I do like the person that I'm becoming. You know what I'm saying? If I'm to quote Michelle Obama, like I, I, I like who I'm becoming. I feel good about it, even though I hate the things that I've had to go through in order to become, to to you know work on becoming that person. Um, and so I think if I'm ever going to forgive or move past, or you know I don't know if I forgive 2020, but you know you know, think, reframe my thinking about it. Um, it would have to be me accepting who I was, who I, what I allowed 2020 to help me become that's greater than what I was before 2020. And if I can see that, if I can see out of 2020, I became a better person, then I can be okay with 2020. Um, still, um, I, if, if God was to tell me, you're going to have to go through this in order to be this better person. Would do you want to do it? I would probably say no, because I don't want to go through that. That's, that's too hurtful. That's too painful. Um, so I think that's why God don't, don't show us. He just, you just got to go through it. Cause you're not going, you're not going to understand how good it's going to make you in the end. You just got to go through it. But the person that you're going to become is going to be so amazing. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I think if I'm, if I'm becoming who I think I'm becoming, then 
I can be like, all right, yeah, I get it. I still don't like 2020. I still got, I still, I still, I still hold a grudge against you. I may not have a beef, but I still hold a grudge. But you know what? It worked out for the better for me. So, yeah. And I would say that I have four words to, <laughs> four, four words um, that I won't explain in detail that I think will in partly be, partly be the way that I'm going to get through it or the way that I recommend all of us to get through our grudge or our beef, however we want to explain it with 2020. Um, for 2021, I feel like 2021, we need to focus on four things. Um, love, sex, drugs, and money. That's what I think we need to do. <laughs> and I think we just need to combine all of those together. Love, sex, um, drugs, and money. Love, sex, drugs, and money. Love, sex, <laughs> drugs, and money. Uh oh, Kunle, we got a hit for you, bro. We got a hit for you, dog. <laughs> I won't go into detail, but especially when it comes to drugs, I think one of my, my friends, Matt Genius, or maybe I'll tag him in here, has a different oh, yeah, explanation. Matt. Dude, Matt a different explanation of substance use and what that means and um, how you can use substances for pleasure because a lot of people, especially Americans and Black folks, we don't know what pleasure really means. Um, with that sex, we're defining how we understand sex, our relationship with sex, especially as Black people, especially as religious folks. Love, we need more of it. And money, shmoney, 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 oh, more money. Okay. Entrepreneurship, business, uh, financial literacy, we need that whole thing. That's, that's what my antidote to 2020 is. And I hope that, you know, we can all get into more of that next year. So John, that's all, right? Are you going to close us out? Ooh, I'm going to close this out, man. This was a great episode. I think, you know what we need to do? I like that for an episode, love, sex, drugs, and money. That's a, that's dope for, uh, for one of our 2021, early 2021 episodes. We don't have to do a whole thing on that one. Um, yo, this was, this was great. I, I loved it. I definitely want to, again, show love to my brother, Kunle, man. Thank you so much for filling in for Jackie, a.k.a. Dr. Hater. We appreciate you. Um, I see you wearing your, 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 your paraphernalia, free, uh, your free sweatshirt right there. Um, so go ahead and take the time, man, and just tell the people, you know what I'm saying, where they can find you, where they can find the stuff that you... Oh, and I'm going to go ahead and say it, bro. I'm still waiting on my Du Bois shirt, bro. I, I I still want that. That's, that's my fault. That's I, my beat. Oh Yo, he that's got my boys I, I've been wanting this thing for like two years. I'm willing to pay whatever. Like, I love that thing so much. I want it so bad. So now it's on video. Now it's on the, on the net. Yeah. Everybody. call me out. <laughs> everybody flood his deals. Say, yo. Tell John how much you want for that Du Bois hoodie. Um, but no, I just said that to say, man, he got some dope, dope, um, you know, material. He got some dope clothes and dope music, man. So just just tell the people a little bit about where they can find you uh, before we close out. Yeah, so, um, yeah, Love Kunle on all platforms. Um, it's on the little thing on the screen. Uh, so this right here, this is our new project. It hasn't we haven't uh, had it out yet, but this is called the Greenwood Exchange. Uh, we have not talked too much about it, but essentially it's going to be a platform for Black businesses. Um, I don't want to go too deep into it because it's it's not, uh, we haven't officially announced it yet, but this is like some of the merch for it or whatever. Um, uh, the, the tagline has been enough. Um, so you can you can kind of, figure figure out what we're going with that um yeah so freedopcreative.com uh freedom creative without an e at the end is our tag on everything all social media platforms um we have a lot of stuff in store for 2021 stuff that was supposed to happen in 2020 but it's given us a lot of time to redevelop thoughts and ideas and whatnot so 2021 is looking very good for freedom creative um and uh I started a podcast, a teaspoon toxic. Uh, episode two comes out tomorrow. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, love yeah. So we, it's it's just alive right now. But you know, we gonna we gonna see what we gonna make it do what it do. But yeah, Freedom Creative. That's that's all I'm about. That's what I've been doing. Uh, hopefully, it'll be my full time gig uh, very soon. Um, but yeah, 
the Greenwood Exchange, Freed Up Creative, freedupcreative.com. Uh, you can find me on that page, on that, that website. We're about to relaunch the website, but the the old version of it is still up if you want to check out what we're doing currently. Facts on facts. Any uh any any updates, Amber, anything you want to talk to the people about before we close out? Oh <laughs> there's so many things that I continue to go on in my head. Um so something will be coming soon. I feel like some transformation will be happening. So just stay tuned. Cool, cool. And yo, just want to let y'all know, Street Academy, we still, I haven't decided on whether 2021 is going to start a new season or if we just going to continue with this season until we, um, until our actual one year anniversary, which I think is like May, the end of the end of May, where when we actually started. Uh, I haven't decided yet, but I will say though, that Street Academy podcast is continually growing. We got a special Kwanzaa episode that's coming up very soon with a special guest that's going to be here. So y'all got to, y'all definitely make sure y'all tune in, follow us, uh, follow me at J Paul Grant, J P A U L G R A N T at Amber Camilla. Um, also at Jack the Demission, you can follow us and find out when the next episode is going to be. Um, you can also subscribe to our YouTube, uh, you know, to our YouTube. And that's always where you can, you know, where I put the link at so you can go check out our full videos so make sure y'all following us on social media so you can know where that is. Um, and yeah, Street Academy, we um, we continually growing and doing great things. So thank y'all for joining us. Again, thanks so much to our special guest, our special co-host, Kunle. Um, and with that being said, all hearts and minds clear? Everybody good? Super clear. Cool. Thank y'all for joining us again, Street Academy Podcast. We out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yay! Boom, boom. Great cool. conversation, guys. This was good. Yo, we appreciate you, bro, bro. Thank you so much, Kool Aid. Yes, man. You know, got their feet upon the neck of the haters, the game and the devil. I came out from the mid. One of the biggest beefs I had with you was when you made that comment about the South. Rap. Oh, we got to get this nigga back on, Amber, because he said that Atlanta destroyed destroyed hip hop music. And I, <laughs> yes, yes. What? What? I the South has something to say. The South always has something to say. <laughs> I'm not talking what? about that version of rap, though. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking be. about Outkast when I say that, though. I'm talking about all these these trash niggas that they have let in the industry because the South has just been open for anybody to exist. Like, it's like, there's no filter on good and bad rap. It's just like anybody who got something to say, literally what Andre said, anybody who got something to say was given a platform. And it's like, now the, the industry is so saturated like, with so much trash. I have to sift through who's good. And I blame that on that. the South. You had to do that. You had to do that too. All, all, all of them fools that came out back then were not hot. They, he was not good. Uh, most of them. No, said, but know. I'm saying, I'm talking about the concentration though. How many, how many like trash rappers, like especially like these popcorn rappers, how many of them existed before Atlanta took over? Like I'm talking about concentration wise. Like, there was always trash rappers in the, not not Atlanta, but the South in general. Like you know, Chicago. Like they brought out Young Berg. Young Berg was never that great. Like this, everybody has like most of them drill rappers come out of their community. Most of them drill rappers. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. But it's like, but I blame Atlanta for that because drill did not like before yeah. drill. Like who before Chief Keef and all of that? No. Like we brought out like Twista, Lupe, yeah. Common, Common, uh, Kanye. You know, like the guy, there was, some, there, was there was very few trash rappers that were coming out. Yeah, like it it wasn't it wasn't like now we got I've seen twenty I saw a list of twenty five drill rappers. I only know three of their names. Not I don't know I know none of their music, but I only know three of their names. But it's like they wouldn't have even been known or existed twenty years ago. Like you would you would have still been selling CDs out of your trunk. Nobody would have given you a platform. And it wasn't until like this new generation. It's like if you have one hot song, they're gonna give you a platform because they know they can make a quick buck off of you. 
but see that's I it. blame the South for that. No, no, no. Yeah. See, that's it. What you just mentioned, you said you said one hot song, you said platform, you said um you what what other words did you say? You said new generation. When you see all of those things, it it's how